Hi, Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another day of Triangle SciTech Expo. Um, thank you so much for joining us today on Friday. We have um, today and tomorrow left of this amazing event, and we are so excited that you are joining us. Um, so my name is Miranda, and I am an educator here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And today we are talking about a really cool topic, 3D printing and bioprinting. Um, but before we dive into that, I want to get us started. So I want you um, all to utilize the chat functions in um, whatever program you're in, either Zoom or YouTube. Um, so let's get it started. I want to hear if you could 3D print or bioprint anything that has ever existed or anything in the world, what would you 3D print? Size does not matter. I just want to hear what would it be? It doesn't have to be a living organism. Um, you know, I just wanted to hear what would you 3D print? All right, so um, <laughs> Aiden says that they would 3D print board game pieces for a board game they are making. Very cool and um, very handy um, to be able to just create things that you need. Um, Skelly said he would 3D print some sunglasses. Maybe he has some um, cool sunglass designs in mind. And, um, I, you know, I don't know what I would 3D print. Um, I've always wanted to, um, like, do some cosplays. Maybe I'd 3D print some helmets or something really cool, some armor. I've seen some of that stuff. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce our expert for today. Um, today we have with us Dr. Roger Narayan. He is a professor at the Joint Department of Biomedical Engineering at North, the University of North Carolina and NC State University. And um, he knows a lot about 3D printing and bioprinting. And Roger, we are so excited to have you with us today. And with that, I'm gonna let you take it away. If anyone has any questions during the, the program, please just throw them in the chat and um, um, we'll get those answered for you. So Roger, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks for uh, the introduction. Uh, can you see my screen? We can, yes. Okay, super. I don't know if the, the, I have some embedded videos. I'm not sure if they'll play uh, as I intend to. I might have to drop out of the, the presentation mode to play them, but they're all within here. So hopefully all will go well. Um, so as uh, Miranda mentioned, uh, I, uh, I'm Roger Narine. I work at the Joint Department of Biomedical Engineering between uh, UNC uh, Chapel Hill and NC State University. And I wanna thank also, uh, Two co-authors of this presentation, Andrew Sachan and Roger Sachan. Um, go ahead and advance this. Oh, there we go. Um, so uh, first, I want to go ahead and um, define what 3D printing is. I think we use the word 3D printing a lot nowadays. Uh, we see it everywhere on TV and on the internet. Uh, we see 3D printed houses, 3D printed food. Uh, 3D printed other things, uh, cars, uh, all sorts of things. What, what does 3D printing mean? So 3D printing uh, refers to a technology where you are making a structure, making a part by building it up in a layer by layer manner. And so uh, usually uh, for up until 30 years ago for, for the of history of humanity, people were making parts by uh, cutting them, contracting them, uh, etching them, trying to remove material. And so 3D printing is different in that you're taking layers of material and attaching them to one another to get a 3D part. Let's see, there we go. So in terms of uh, 3D printing for uh, the um, medical applications for, for use by doctors and dentists and surgeons. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that's done. Uh, the, right now in hospitals today, people are making guides and I'll show some examples of that. They'll, they'll basically make tools that allow surgeons to uh, do their surgeries more efficiently, more quickly. Um, so that's something which is being done today. Um, there are also, uh, things that we see around us that are made possible by 3D printing. So if you know uh, a relative or uh, you see uh, people in stores or uh, out in the community who have hearing aids, the hearing aid shell, the part that contains the electronics, 
um, that goes in, in people's ears, that often is made by 3D printing because 3D printing allows that to be personalized to uh, that person's ear. Uh, a lot of dental products are now being made by 3D printing. And also there's a lot of research at, at NC State, at UNC, at, at other universities in North Carolina, including at Wake Forest, in trying to make artificial tissues uh, by 3D printing. And so I'll mention some of that also today. So there are a lot of advantages when people talk about 3D printing. Uh, we talk about the fact that it's different from traditional ways to make parts and that you're adding materials together instead of subtracting them. And so how does that make the part better? Um, and essentially it makes the parts better because uh, you can uh, essentially make more complex shapes. Uh, you can uh, create all sorts of intricate internal features, features inside the part that are much uh, more complex than if you're having to subtract or remove material to create a part. And uh, you can also use a variety of new types of materials. There are examples we'll see today where they're using different sorts of uh, input materials, different types of feedstock materials together to make a part. And so you can, you can do a lot of complex things that are not possible through con conventional ways to build parts with 3D printing, which makes it so exciting. Uh, there's, a, there's all this uh, talk in the news about energy. And so people talk about the fact that energy might be saved by 3D printing. Uh, you can use low energy materials. Um, you, can, uh, so you don't have to sort of save steps when you're 3D printing. You, as we saw before, you can make these complex shapes. So you're, you can make it something lightweight. And so you can make something lightweight by sort of making it hollow in the center. That's also sort of more sustainable, uh, more of an energy reducing feature. Uh, but one thing that people see when they're sort of using a 3D printer, and this is a, an industrial scale 3D printer, one of the things they see is that it could also involve energy because you're having to make the, the, the sort of input materials, the feedstock materials, the building materials for 3D printing and that takes energy. So that's sort of embedded energy. You see um, filaments for 3D printing that sort of has embedded energy, even though you're sort of being very um, sort of uh, uh, co conscious and, and uh, saving of, of material, there's a lot of embedded energy when you make the sort of, uh, sort of uh, beginning pieces to, to 3D print a part. Uh, there are a lot of different applications we've seen, and, and many of you have seen these uh, on TV or on the internet. A lot of uh, parts that used in airplanes now are made by 3D printing, especially by the military. So uh, the United States Air Force has a lot of effort in making uh, metal parts for 3D printing. Um, one of the uh, mainstays of, of uh, the defense of, of the United States involves a uh, B-52 bomber uh, that's been uh, that type of aircraft has been around now for uh, 70 years, and they want to keep that type of aircraft in the air for several more decades, obviously, to make replacement parts for these types of aircraft and to uh, create uh, sort of uh, uh, a, a sort of uh, parts at the ready when you need them. And uh, one of the ways in which the Air Force is, is taking care of this is by not having a warehouse full of parts for you know, 50 years, but by 3D printing the part so that when that, that type of airplane needs new parts, you can print it when it's needed. Of course, for the medical space, there are a lot of effort to make prosthetics, prosthetic hands. There are a lot of universities, including at NC State, where undergraduates are, are involved with making hands that are then distributed to people who need prosthetic hands. So that's a way in which young people can get involved uh, right after high school and in, in trying to help others and help the community. And there's also efforts in, in automobiles and making new automotive parts. Um, there is, a, as you can see in that uh, picture, uh, a sort of fourth down, there's a, a, a organization in Tennessee called Local Motors that made a whole 3D printed car. Uh, and so they've made these sort of prototype cars where all of the parts are 3D printed 
and so this is a sort of where where a lot of interest is and they're also interested in making houses that are 3d printed and i was at a meeting prior to this this morning where i was told also for, uh, faculty at nc state professors at nc state are working on making parts of houses through 3d printing so there's a lot of effort in 3D printing around the world. As you can see in that pie chart on the right, it's occurring in the US and Europe and Japan. There are a lot of interests. So if you're interested in, in medical devices, in cars, uh, in, in aerospace, if you're interested in doing a lot of other variety of things, um, uh, you can find ways to, to use 3D printing to, to build those parts. So it's uh, used in a lot of technological areas. In terms of the growth, it's a very fast growing field. Uh, it's a multi billion dollar field. So there are a lot of jobs for young people who are interested in 3D printing. So it's a, it's a sort of a, a skill that can be both a hobby, but also a way to, to sort of find a, a job and, and make a career. And if you look at these sort of uh, where people spend the money, they spend it on the printers, but they also spend it on the material. So once you've bought the printer, you have to spend money on the materials in order to, to sort of uh, keep the printer working. Uh, and so there's a, it's not, you might think, oh, if somebody's bought printers, what, what, where will be people be spending money? Actually, there's, there's a sort of going to be an economy for, for making the materials for the printers for a very long time. So it makes it very useful uh, you know, to, to think about the long term of this field. And, and there's a lot of, I think, growth coming up for 3D printing. And you can see this is medical 3D printing, how the growth of the field is. And you can see it's growing very quickly. It's, a, it's a, as you can see here, a multi-billion dollar field uh, uh, where, where in 2024, it'll be you know, close to $10 billion just for medical 3D printing. And, and so one of the areas in medical 3D printing is dental. And you can see here, these are components that are used in the mouth crowns and bridges, dental, denture frameworks. Um, you can see here, most of these things will be entirely made by 3D printing and just in the next uh, six, seven years. And so this is something where if you wanna be a dentist or if you're thinking about what are people, where, where is 3D printing being used? You can see here so much of what's being used by dentists and just, just one field of, of, of uh, healthcare will be coming out of 3D printers. So now I'll show some examples of 3D printing and I'll show some videos. Uh, I was very lucky uh, to have um, uh, one of the journals that makes videos on 3D printing called the Journal of Visualized Experiments provide permission. Uh, and I, I shared that with Carrie, uh, uh, that, that we we're, were able to share some of the snippets from the videos um, uh, as part of this presentation. So I'll show some of the printing techniques through videos. Uh, so that way and, uh, we, can, we can see how these things work in action. So I talked about um, what 3D printing is. It's joining together material in a layer by layer manner. And what we'll see uh, throughout the next uh, 30, 40 minutes is that uh, there are many ways to join material together in a layer by layer manner. There are many 3D printing techniques. Uh, one of them is the one that you see in, in, in like the Home Depots and, and uh, Office Depots, which are, are these printers that use filament in order to build a part. So the filament is, is heated and it fuses together with other pieces of filament to create a part. There are also uh, techniques based on inkjet printers. So these are similar to the inkjet printers you can find in, in uh, your office supply stores like Office Depot and, and Staples. So these inkjet printers basically print um, inks uh, and, and can, can create the structures in three dimensions by printing in inks, just like an inkjet printer does. There's also laser sintering, uh, which is where you take a powder and, and basically this, this powder is heated by a laser. So this laser energy is very high energy. Uh, uh, and basically that high energy uh, from the lasers transferred to the powder and joins it together. And then there's something called photopolymerization, which is where you take light and selectively harden a liquid polymer to make it a solid polymer. So in many ways, it's like, um, uh, you know, microwaving food, you could say. You, you can take some 
uh, foods uh, and um, you're applying energy to them and they'll sort of uh, go from, in the case of for a lot of microwave foods, you take them frozen to liquid and then if you heat them enough, they'll become a solid. So, but the photopolymerization, you're, you're simply taking a, a, a liquid uh, and you're converting it to the solid form of, of that, that material uh, because it, it's causing bonds to form in the, 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 the sort of liquid that causes cross-linking and it causes hardening of the material. This is used a lot of times in fillings. If you've had a filling, they'll oftentimes take a, a liquid filling It'll apply the blue light and it converts to a solid filling. So that's a very good example of, of uh, photopolymerization in our daily lives. And it's very similar to the sort of things that we see with uh, uh, crazy glue, except that you're not using light uh, for most types of glues that are, are out there uh, at the stores. But it's, again, it's trying to sort of take a liquid and convert it to a solid. Um, so 3D printing, as I mentioned, is a variety of different uh, techniques. There are many techniques that actually uh, fall under the, the, the name 3D printing, and we've sort of covered them, but I think the uh, sort of uniform among 3D printing techniques is you're taking a uh, precursor material or feedstock material, a starting material, whether it be the filaments or the powder or the liquid, and you're taking energy, and you're applying it to that that starting material to create these 3D printed parts. And so there are a lot of names for them. No, I'm not gonna focus on that, but the idea is essentially you're joining together these starting materials with energy so that they're you're basically joining them together in a layer by layer manner to create a 3D part. You can all use all the different types of materials out there that we see in our daily lives. So polymers or plastic type of materials, metals, materials that we see made by natural organisms um, and also uh, ceramics. Uh, so all of these classes of materials are also used in 3D printing. And so this kind of shows how all these different classes of materials are being used not only in medical, but also in aerospace and in cars and in consumer products and in architecture. So all of the different types of materials that uh, chemists and physicists work with are being used in um, 3D printing. One of the things is, uh, as I mentioned before, 3D printing is now all around us. So uh, a lot of you have seen uh, Invisalign and Smile Direct and these uh, dental aligners. These are personalized. So the way that this technology is possible is that they take uh, scans of, of your mouth, and then um, they're able to then uh, photopolymerize 3D printed uh, structures. The part that goes in your mouth is not that 3D printed part, it's actually molded from that 3D printed part, but it, it is only possible because something that matches your own dental structure, your own teeth uh, orientation, uh, can be can be 3D printed, uh, made into a physical object based on, on, on the sort of scan of your mouth. There are also all sorts of implants and prosthetic devices coming out. As I mentioned before, people, a lot of people, including undergraduates and other young people are, are printing hands for people who need hand prostheses. Uh, companies are making very uh, uh, sort of uh, functional, uh, very well-designed uh, prosthetic le limbs, like the prosthetic leg you see in the image at the, at the end of the screen. And you can see a lot of devices have been approved by the FDA, things from the head to the toe. So the lots of devices have been approved. So it gives a sort of a, and you can imagine uh, this is just one example from a few years ago. Every, every year now, more and more of these parts are being 3D printed. So I'll give an example of what's done. Uh, this is an example of uh, where uh, they take data from um, a, a person. Uh, this is a, sort of a variation of an X-ray for imaging. 
called computed tomography or CT imaging. And they take this sort of a specialized X-ray to understand the geometry of uh, someone's um, someone's body. If you need, for example, replacement bone, they can take an image of where the bone has some some problems, and then they can also, because the body is sort of bilaterally symmetric, it's the same uh, you know on either side of the the, the midline. You can also take an image of the other side and sort of understand what what the the normal version of, of that that the sort of uh, geometry should look like. And so this is used a lot for trying to help people who've had uh, traumatic injuries if they've had been in a car accident or there's otherwise uh, been in an accident where they had trauma to the face. Uh, you can uh, actually get uh, models that can help the surgeon sort of understand how to uh, uh, sort of repair those errors. This is also used a lot of time in the brain because the brain has a very complex blood vessel structure. Being able to 3D print the uh, features in the brain, the blood vessels in the brain is really important because it allows for the, the surgeons to plan how they will try to uh, interact with those blood vessels. So let's see. Oh, it looks like it is embedded. So this is an example of where uh, uh, this is, was published in the journal Visualize Experiments, how they were able to do this. Um, and you can see here. So Roger, while we're um, watching, looking at this video, um, we did have a question um, as to what kind of apps would you use to draw um, the thing that you're printing? So you're showing some of this 3D modeling on a like a computer. Um, do you have any resources or um, can you tell us of anything, what you would recommend to use? Yeah, uh, so there is a, um, a lot of free, um, software now available to download. Um, and so nowadays Windows 10 has a software that allows you to view 3D models. Uh, so you can, uh, in fact, download any of these sort of files of 3D representations and now look at them on any of your computers. But to actually draw, um, there are, um, Three versions of some of the software. Um, the university has um, computer aided design, uh, drawing software, which is um, which is uh, sort of a, on a license. But I can I, what I can do is to put a list of uh, the the what call uh, CAD software um, that that's available for free. Uh, I, I can share that via email. You can also look on download.com, which is uh, uh, a, a, sort of a freeware site, and they will have many different uh, sort of CAD uh, drawing software. I don't typically use the free version because uh, uh, we, we have access to uh, the students, uh, pay a student fee to have access to the paid version. So I haven't used any of the free versions recently, but I'll, I'll try to look up some free drawing software uh, to answer more specifically around what, what's available at any time. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I know um, I have a couple coworkers who um, kind of do it and they're um, a little bit to the side of their, their main jobs and they um, both use ZBrush, um, but I have never done anything like it. So I have no idea, I have no recommendations. But I think, yeah, I just Googled like 3D, um, uh, you know, drawing software and there was a, a, a list. Yeah, I think a lot of times the, I think even for the ones that the students have the pay the license for from their student fees, the, those have free trials. But I, yeah, I think I'll, I'll try to get some more details. And I think the example you gave, the, the, that's probably the, as good as any. Um, yeah. And uh, here's another, oh, so this is the same photo. So this is an example of where a surgical guide was made by 3D printing. So this helps the surgeon 
sort of orient how they'll do the surgery based on, a, on these three printed uh, polymer pieces. So here, I'll take this example. And Roger, we're not hearing any sound. I don't know if these videos have sound on them. Oh. So if you go up to your um, sharing, you should be able to turn on the share, share computer sound. At the top of your screen. The designs for these representative fibular cutting, maxillary cutting, and fibular fixation guides were created and exported in STL format as demonstrated for 3D printing. The maxillary cutting and fibular cutting guides were then completely fitted to the facial bone and fibular bone models. The models were cut with a saw and the resulting model was fixed with titanium plates and screws. A 3D reconstructed image was then determined by a 3D scanner within an approximately 2 mm deviation. So this just showed how, in fact, you can not only three, take, take uh, sort of a data from one of these CT scanners, and then make these custom parts that would fit around the bones. But then you could also image afterwards to see how well the fit is between the 3D printed part and the surrounding bone. So you can sort of do this sort of uh, loop to, to confirm the, the fit uh, of, of these 3D printed parts. So as I mentioned, the one type of 3D printer you'll see most commonly around you at your uh, homes and schools and libraries and at stores is fused deposition modeling. So this is where you're essentially, uh, you have a filament, you heat the filament, comes out of a tip, and then you're building lay it layer by layer. And when it cools, it basically joins with the underlying layers of filament to create the 3D part. And so you're essentially drawing this, this uh, nozzle over the surface, uh, building, uh, moving uh, things, uh, and, and, and oftentimes you're sort of, um, as you can see, um, moving the, 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 the uh, nozzle in, in what you could call, what the technical term is, is the XY plane. So in two dimensions on a flat surface, like you're writing on a page, essentially. So you're just, just like you can write on the page, you can write sort of in one, one direction and then uh, in another direction. And then you can move the, the stage down in order to build one layer of this filament over another layer of the filament. You're moving the stage down, you keep drawing in this sort of um, this sheet on top of uh, this, these sheets. And as you're moving the stage down, you can make the structure taller and taller. The advantage is that it's a pretty inexpensive process. So you can see these 3D printers are around us for pretty low cost, around $100, $110, $120 are the cheapest ones. You can find materials that are relatively inexp inexpensive to use as the, the sort of input materials, the, the feedstock materials, the build materials. Um, also, uh, if the parts that come out, you don't have to sort of do any sort of post sort of modifications to them. You can use them as is if you want to. But there are very few materials that are compatible, that are usable with, with few fused deposition modeling. And then you also have to make the material into a filament. So that kind of goes back to what I mentioned earlier is that it takes a lot of energy and time and effort to make that material with the, that you want to build a part out of into a filament. The other thing that you see when you're building material out of filaments is that when you look at it under a microscope, it's not a solid material. It might look like a solid material to your eyes, but under a microscope, it actually has a, a crosshatch feature. And so it's not completely solid. And so that means that, uh, in fact, it's easy to pull the material apart. If you try to pull apart a material that comes out of these printers, oftentimes it's easy to do so because it's not entirely solid. 
but it also it, it, that that affects the mechanical sturdiness of it for your end application. There's also a, a sort of a follow-on of this approach called a biopotter. And NC State University has one of these devices. It essentially has a needle, and the needle sort of uh, pushes material out. And you can not only print materials like polymers and, and materials that come from nature, like collagen, which is a sort of a polymer made by nature, uh, but you can also print cells. Um, and so this is an example of, of live cells that can be printed, you could say 3D printed. They're coming out of the nozzle and, and uh, you can essentially create a three-dimensional cell containing structure. So this is sort of a, a living structure that comes uh, through out of a bioplotter. And you can make these uh, 3D printed um, cell containing structures in any sort of shape that's useful for an application. The typical application for this right now is to make structures that can be used for drug testing. So if you make a new type of pharmaceutical or drug, you wanna see how well it functions. And so you can test it against the sort of agglomeration of cells that come out of the bioplotter. People also, as I mentioned, use 3D printers. I mean, sorry, uh, um, inkjet printers for 3D printing. So these are just like the inkjet printers you see at Office Depot and Staples. If you look at, at inkjet printers, there are actually um, two different types of ways in which inkjet printers work. So inkjet printers are made by Hewlett Packard or what's called thermal inkjet printers. They apply heat uh, for, for microseconds. That uh, goes well above uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and that causes a bubble to form, and that bubble is ejected. Uh, the printers made by Epson work uh, based on piezoelectric uh, setup. So that means that you uh, piezoelectric is a material called lead zirconate titanate, or PZT. Um, and essentially, if you apply um, electricity to that material, the, 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 that PZT will vibrate and it will, uh, because it, we call that a piezoelectric effect, uh, the ability to sort of uh, uh, convert this electrical energy to mechanical energy, this vibration um, and vice versa. In any case, uh, being able to convert that electrical energy to this vibration of this uh, piezoelectric uh, component allows for bubbles to form and, and, and be ejected. So you can create inkjet material either through heat or through this piezoelectric effect. And printers like that are available uh, all the time. We have the piezoelectric version at Clemson. Uh, their research into 3D printing for medical applications involved the Hewlett Packard printer. And so people use both of these types uh, for printing. So this is an example of a study we did uh, involving an adhesive that came from the blue mussel in the Chesapeake Bay. So this material is basically like a natural adhesive. The, the mussel attaches to uh, undersea structures, to ships, to the piers, uh, based on, on a protein called mussel adhesive protein. And that protein can, can become more sticky by adding iron to it. And so we, we printed the muscle adhesive protein with our inkjet printer. Uh, and so you can see here, we changed the voltage applied to the piezoelectric. And so that was able to increase the velocity of drops coming from the printer of this muscle adhesive. And then by adding iron, we could make the material more cross-linked. We can make the protein cross-linked more, which means that the, the protein basically had more sort of bonds with other parts of the protein in the solution, and that made it more sticky. And you can actually see here, when you look at how sticky things are, these are much less sticky than crazy glue, but you could print out these adhesives and print out uh, the, the iron on it to make it stickier than without iron, and, and you could make it well, sticky enough for many applications. So it actually, um, there's a company called Fisher Scientific that sells uh, a, a sort of a, a muscle adhesive that can be used for joining uh, things on, on for biomedical applications. Um, and so you, this is not just something that is done 
purely in the lab. This is also being used a lot in biotechnology, uh, being able to use muscle adhesive protein. And so it's finding greater and greater use. So uh, here's an, another example from uh, Joe, where they show how you can use an inkjet printer to print cartilage. To begin this procedure, turn on the printer and laptop. Using Microsoft Word, create a printing pattern of a solid circle with a diameter of four millimeters. Place the plastic mold into the printer. Adjust the position of the pattern and make sure it will print exactly into the plastic mold. Calculate the number of prints needed to reach the desired thickness of scaffold. For a height of 4 mm, 220 prints are required to create the desired scaffold. Load the bioink into the ink cartridge. Cover the cartridge with aluminum foil to protect from direct UV exposure during printing. Send the printing command to the printer. When the printer starts to print, pull the paper sensor in order to continue printing in the absence of paper passing through the printer. The whole printing process should take less than 4 minutes for a scaffold of 4 mm in diameter and 4 mm in height. Transfer printed neocartilage to a 24 well plate and add 1.5 milliliters of culture medium to each well. To evaluate cell viability, incubate the printed neocartilage in live dead viability cytotoxicity working solution at room temperature for 15 minutes in the dark. So, so one of the things you can see from that is that uh, essentially you use an inkjet printer, the, the, the team here use an inkjet printer to print uh, the cells and uh, a, a polymer, a, a sort of a, a plastic type of material that surrounds the cells. And then um, they were able to, as I mentioned, in four minutes, get something that you could see uh, visually uh, four millimeters tall and then you can sort of assume to get something as big as you need for you know, a human uh, treatment application, you have to print it for a bit longer. And then the next thing they have to do is to sort of bathe those uh, sort of cells in, in a, a liquid that keeps the cells alive. And then they wanna then assess how the cells are performing so then they can do various tests to understand the functionality. So that's essentially the sort of steps that people use when printing cells uh, using uh, these sorts of inkjet printing processes. And you can see that that inkjet, inkjet printer looks just like a printer uh, that, that comes out of the store. They in fact even have to disable the, the paper, uh, <laughs> paper uh, sensor so that the, it doesn't sense that there's pa uh, paper underneath. So you can take something directly from, from your local store and, and do something very similar to this with plant cells or, or uh, with other things in, in your environment with a lot of polymers that are out there. Um, so another technique that I mentioned uh, at, at the beginning is this idea of uh, sort of hardening a, a, a liquid into a solid um, by application of light. That light can come from a lamp or can come from a laser and uh, the, this is the oldest 3D printing technique. The idea is that you're essentially using light from a lamp or a laser to selectively uh, cure and harden a liquid. And then you, as I mentioned before, with the other techniques, you lower the, the stage as you're building these structures, making the structures taller and taller. You lower the stage and then you're able to get, um, after, you, after each step, you lower the stage again and again you can get a, a 3D part at the end of that. Now, the, the problem in medical applications of, of 3D printing uh, via stereolithography is that the, the chemicals uh, that are used to uh, harden a liquid to a solid are generally toxic. So the, the chemistry that's used to, to uh, harden that liquid involves generation of free radicals. And as you hear in the news and see around us, free radicals are, are uh, sort of things that uh, sort of cause havoc with biology. So uh, the big problem is if you wanna use any of these parts that come out of a 3D printer using stereolithography, 
The challenge is it has a lot of embedded chemical that generates uh, free radicals. And so there's a lot of uh, research at NC State and my lab and other labs to try to figure out how to reduce the toxicity associated with um, these sort of toxic chemicals within uh, stereolithography created parts. So one st study we work on is to make microneedles um, with 3D printing for biosensing applications. So we from 3D print microneedles that can go in the skin and then we can then put sensors in the center of these microneedles and then sense chemicals underneath the surface of the skin. So here's a, another video showing how this is done. Begin in the three-dimensional modeling software SOLIDWORKS and design a pyramidal-shaped hollow microneedle array. Then, using the Magix RP13 software, design a support structure that provides a base on which the microneedles are built. Next, control the fabrication process using the Perfactory RP software. Upload both the linked support and the microneedle array files. Then, select the number of microneedle arrays to be fabricated and determine the placement of devices on the fabrication plate. In the Perfactory Rapid Prototyping Manufacturing System, select ultraviolet mode at 100 milliwatts and perform the calibration procedure. Verify the deviation in the energy is within plus or minus 2 milliwatts. Once fabrication of the microneedle array is complete, remove the microneedle array from the base plate. Develop an isopropanol for 15 minutes. Then dry the arrays with compressed air. To ensure complete polymerization, cure the microneedles at room temperature for 50 seconds. Examine the microneedles via light microscopy. Verify that each fully fabricated microneedle bore is hollow and unobstructed. So essentially you can see here how we're making the microneedles. Um, and um, we mentioned a lot of proprietary software, costly software. Obviously you could do a lot of the stuff with, with free software as well, um, but we're not, uh, uh, generally for home use, you wouldn't want to use SolidWorks or Magix or these other, other types of software. But uh, certainly if you need a, to find a free version, I think you'll, you'll find uh, I can help any of you find that, uh, just send me an email and you can look into that. Um, uh, so this is an example of how the sensors work. Uh, certainly the sensors are able to detect chemicals uh, that, that are uh, interact with the, the sensor within the, the, those little holes in the microneedle. Um, we also have a laser uh, set up that we've looked at for, for transferring cells. So this is where you take a laser and then move material that's on, on a, on, on, which is spin coated, which is coated on, on, a, on a quartz uh, disc, and then you can move it to another surface. So you, this way, in this way, you can also 3D print a, surf, a surface with cells or biomaterials. Here's an example of where we took a ceramic, which is similar to the chemical composition of bone, it's made out of calcium and phosphorus. And this is uh, the sort of ribbon, uh, which is which where, where we transferred the, the material from. And these are the patterns that we were able to make. So we took this sort of spin coated uh, uh, quartz disc, we hit it with a laser and we're able to then, uh, because it was laser pretty low energy, it didn't sort of fry that material, it simply dissorbed the material from that quartz disc we were able to make these sort of square line and dot patterns. We were able to look at it chemically, see that it was the material wasn't uh, sort of harmed by that laser energy. We we're also able to transfer bone forming cells using the same approach and the cells remained alive after they were transferred. And in fact, they grew and formed uh, sort of replica cells that continued to proliferate and grow and thrive 72 hours after they were transferred by the laser. And you can see that they, were, they grew at rates similar to that of cells grown on, on normal plastic cell culture surfaces. So this is an example of where they printed silver the same way, but it shows the hardware that's used to, for, for printing with a laser. Now, attempt to laser print some voxels. First, 
fire a single laser pulse onto the donor substrate. Begin somewhere between 40 and 60 millijoules per square centimeter. If the focus position is correct, and if the energy is sufficiently high, a voxel will be ejected. Check for a square hole in the ribbon ink layer, which indicates a voxel was ejected. Then, move aside the donor substrate and inspect the ejected voxel. If the hole isn't visible or clear, adjust the beam focus by repositioning the objective. If the focus is correct but no voxel appeared, then gradually increase the energy of the laser. If a hole appears but seems to quickly disappear, it could be refilling with ink. This occurs when the ink viscosity is too low. Try drying the ribbon for another 30 minutes. So this kind of shows how people print, print the used materials. In this case, they were printing a silver paste. But it's the same sort of approach. They're sort of transferring uh, the silver paste from, from uh, what they call the ribbon, the donor site, onto the, the, the sort of uh, other surface, the pattern the surface showing the pattern. And one of the things they mentioned at the end is that even once you've transferred it, if, if the material has, is, is uh, not viscous, if it's more like a liquid than a solid, then the material will just sort of flow back and you won't will be able to see where you've transferred the material. So you can sort of increase the, the, the solid-like nature of it, the viscosity of it by drying it. Um, and so uh, we'll finish up by a discussion of bioprinting. Uh, bioprinting is where you're printing with living cells. Uh, this is a new term that's just come out in the past 10 years. Um, and the challenge for bioprinting is that uh, there are uh, a lot of people waiting for organ transplants, tissue transplants. People, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, die every day waiting for a transplant. And so techniques like the laser technique I just showed a minute ago, inkjet printing, photopolymerization, uh, which we also talk about, these are all ways in which you can also uh, create these cell-containing structures. They're also techniques for bioprinting. They're not only techniques for 3D printing, but they're also used for bioprinting. And so you can see some examples of what bioprinters look like. Here's one video. Maintain sterility by placing the bioprinter in a laminar flow cabinet. Then, attach sterile printing nozzles to the cartridges containing the bioink cell suspension blends and insert them into the bioprinter. After calibrating the bioprinter, bioprint the lattice structured cell laden constructs using the 25 gauge conical nozzle at a pressure of 25 kilopascals. Bioprint cell free constructs as a control. Crosslink the constructs by adding an ionic solution of 100 millimolar calcium chloride. After five minutes, rinse the constructs. Then, incubate the constructs in culture medium under standard culture conditions, changing the media every second or third day. Collect samples for histological analysis at weeks two and four. So one of the things you see there is that they put cells into the ink they have this bio uh, printer print it, and then they have to transfer it to this, uh, this setup, this metallic setup called the incubator. And if you saw the parameters of the incubator, it's basically body, body temperature, it's 37 degrees Celsius or 98 degrees Fahrenheit. And also it has the sort of uh, other parameters that we see uh, associated with sort of the human body. So, Essentially, when you're printing cells, you don't leave them at, at room temperature, you have to put them at body temperature, and then they can then be sort of, uh, they're surrounded by nutrients that will thrive, and then you can study them over time. Uh, here's another A representative of printed neocartilage tissue with a diameter of four millimeters and a height of four millimeters is shown in this photo. Based on the properties of the modified thermal inkjet printer, for a construct of this size, the volume and thickness of each printed layer during layer-by-layer -layer construction were 0.23 microliters and 18 microns, respectively. The entire printing process to construct the neocartilage tissue took less than four minutes. 
So I'm not seeing any imagery on this one. It's labeled with green and orange fluorescent. Here we go. I don't know how that stuff. Panel A shows an even cell distribution of printed chondrocytes in the 3D scaffold due to simultaneous photopolymerization of the surrounding scaffold during cell deposition. The printing and photopolymerization process was completed in four minutes with a cell viability of 90%. So uh, I think there looks like the, my computer memory is sort of going. So I think that's the last video. So I'm glad it didn't fail earlier. <laughs> uh, so basically, uh, this sort of bioprinting involves cells, involves non-cell components, which we call the psychic scaffold, which sort of support the cells. And then there's it sort of fits into this uh, sort of paradigm of, of being able to be used for drug testing, but then also eventually the idea is that you'll, you can use it for clinical trials, you can use it in planting the body and sort of evaluate the performance of these, uh, these bioprinted uh, issues and organs in the body at some point in the future. We're not there yet. Of course, this is a very fast growing area. It's a multi-billion dollar area. And so this is a, a great uh, opportunity for uh, sort of uh, future jobs and uh, a lot of, uh, opportunities for a career. Certainly there are a lot of companies starting in this area. So if you're interested in starting a company and you have a, some product to offer, this offers a lot of opportunities to, to uh, create a, a solution for, for making new tissues and organs. And there are a lot of companies, I think in the triangle we have a lot of pharmaceutical companies. A lot of pharmaceutical companies have bioprinting programs because you can use it for drug testing. Uh, it's also used for cosmetics testing and, and as I mentioned before, for tissue regeneration. There are a lot of technical challenges uh, to uh, printing. Uh, the problem is that it's very slow. As you can see there, it takes four minutes to make something that's just so very small in size to make something that fits over you know, the size of a kidney or the size of a knee or the size of a, a hip bone would take very long time. So the real challenge is how do you try to do things very quickly and still have a high resolution, small features in the printed part. And so one way that people have seen is that lasers do it more quickly because you can sort of move a laser around much more quickly than you can move around that inkjet uh, cartridge or a nozzle, these other techniques. Also there are problems in terms of trying to find the cells, uh, trying to um, find growth factors, trying to keep the cells alive and then how, to, uh, how the Food and Drug Administration and others will regulate these structures. So these, there are a lot of challenges. So that's where why universities research this. That's why uh, folks in industrial engineering at NC State and biomedical engineering and, and other parts of uh, NC State are working on this. And of course, there are researchers at Duke and UNC and at Wake Forest who also spend a lot of time uh, trying to improve the technology so that you can get uh, more functional parts made by 3D printing. So the last thing I want to mention, which is I think the most important thing out of this for people who work in, uh, with these things in the garage or their home or at their uh, school is that there are emissions from 3D printers. So this is something I, I really want to mention is that when you see an, a 3D printer at the office depot or the home depot or at your school library, you should be aware of the fact that there are particles, very small particles that are emitted by these. And so these things have uh, health effects potentially. And so you can see from this last video with sort of particles that can come out of a 3D printer. Um, this, the memory has just failed on this thing. Let me see if I get it out of, I get it out of this mode and just show it here. If it looks better. Here we go. Can you see it? As observed, yes. higher numbers yes. of ABS black particles are released during printing compared to printing with PLA black. Increasing the temperature during the printing of PLA results in higher particle number concentrations with no significant effect on the geometric mean diameter of the particles. Printing with ABS results in high particle number concentrations and larger particles compared to printing with PLA.
As expected, a clear trend in difference in the geometric mean diameter is observed between the particles emitted during printing with ABS and PLA filaments. Transmission electron microscopy imaging shows particle sizes mostly around 50 nanometers for PLA and almost consistently larger particles up to 100 nanometers for ABS black. PLA copper filaments contain copper, mostly in crystalline form, as well as PLA particles. In this image, a released carbon nanotube from a PLA carbon nanotube filament is possibly observed. The release of small steel particles during the printing with a PLA steel filament and a possible agglomeration of silver aluminum flakes during printing with PLA compound with an incredibly high silver aluminum flakes amount may also be observed. So uh, that shows uh, the challenges, especially if you're using some of these, the, some of these um, new types of uh, inks they're making uh, uh, these composite inks or composite filaments that contain wood or metal. And certainly you'd want to get a, a part that has a nice metallic sheen, but you certainly don't want those metallic particles to be in your environment. So that shows one of the challenges around printing is, is this particle generation and making sure you have a, a open aeration and good ventilation when you're doing this sort of work. Another thing is obviously 3D printing isn't perfect for everything. Not everything in the next 10, 20, 30 years will be 3D printed. 3D printing is much more expensive than injection molding. So most parts in the end, if you have to make uh, 10,000 or 100,000 or a million, it's easier to injection mold them. But still 3D printing is an important role when you have to make unique parts or parts in low volumes. And finally, there are a lot of uh, sort of materials challenges that, uh, researchers at NC State and elsewhere I look at is in terms of uh, the, the, the materials, uh, the, the way in which the, the chemistry at, at small length scales, and at the micro scale and below the micro scale at the nano scale, uh, you know, exist in these structures, how pores, we saw pores in some of these structures, how pores affect the way in which these structures behave. And also, as I mentioned before, you have some of these, these uh, chemicals containing free radicals how do those, uh, the, the toxicity from those affect the functionality? So uh, a, lot of, a lot of research uh, going on in 3D printing and bioprinting. I, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I, think, I saw some hands raised. I think we have a few minutes. I'd be glad to answer any questions that come up. Yeah, so this is all so fascinating. And I, like, I had no idea um, all the different technologies around 3D printing. Every time I think of 3D printing, I think of, you know, just those you know, filament machines or like um, resin machines that um, I've seen. And so um, the technology is amazing. Um, uh, Chris did um, ask, um, will the future of medicine and surgery rely largely on bioprinting? I know that, you know, it was years ago we heard of like, maybe the future is, um, you know, that organs can be 3D printed from the um, person's own tissue so they don't have to worry about rejection and things like that. Are we still hoping that that is the future of things like that? Or is it a little bit out of the realm after we've been doing this research? No, I think there, so uh, I always, I, I, I ran a workshop on 3D printing for one of the uh, professional societies in this field on Tuesday. And uh, I had a colleague from Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine speak. And he mentioned that they have so many uh, studies underway uh, and uh, the, the uh, sort of uh, studies by Professor Tony Atala uh, in, uh, of a variety of tissues show the ability to sort of create a structure and implant it in humans. And they've shown sort of uh, improved function in, in humans for um, a variety of different uh, uh, medical conditions. So. Certainly, uh, they've, they've shown uh, an approach for doing this at Wake Forest, and, and, uh, and uh, I think that that's one, one center for this, not only in the state, but nationally uh, and internationally. We're trying to translate uh, some of these uh, sort of tissue, artificial tissue technologies. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's amazing. My dad has, is a 
lung transplant recipient and, you know, the amount of medication he's on just to uh, make sure he doesn't reject it is, is um, unbelievable. So it's a, a, definitely an exciting future to think about um, these processes and, and get to watch them. Hopefully they move at least as fast as like cell phone technology has moved. Because <laughs> it seems like it's just been um, so quick. Um, over the past, you know, 10, 15 years. But um, Roger, I want to thank you again so much for joining us today and um, telling us more about 3D printing and bioprinting. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us for this program. Um, if you would like to watch it again or share it with friends, it will be available on our YouTube channel. And um, along with all of the other programs um, from SciTech this week. And um, if you have any other, um, when it, look at this, information or this research any more than just look Roger up, um, Roger Narayan. Um, you know, he's at NC State and um, the University of North Carolina. So um, if you have any further questions, just let us know. You can email us at the museum and we will um, try to get in touch with Roger for you. So um, I wanna say a big thank you to the Biogen Foundation and the NC SciFest who are our sponsors for this event. And a thank you to our museum members without our friends much of the programming at the museum would not be possible. And if you're not a member of the museum, you can become one, just check out naturalsciences.org and um, look up that membership. And thank you again, Roger. And we hope to see you guys at more programs um, today and tomorrow. Um, thanks again and have a great day. <laughs>